Our next speaker is Pia, oh, Pia Beton, so, I'm so sorry, um, from Eden Speakerman. And um, also what I've mentioned earlier, Eden Speakerman will be facilitating a workshop at four o'clock upstairs. Um, so, you know, and that can be a continuation of this presentation, I believe. So the floors are yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yes, my name is Pia Betton. I am one out of, I actually just counted 10 partners at Eden Spiekermann. We're in three countries. We're in the US, in San Francisco, in Amsterdam, and I'm one of the partners here in Berlin. We're about 90 employees around the world, and we work a lot with service design. But before I start digging into yet another case, I think it's your turn to do something nice. So I'm going to do what everyone hates but love afterwards. I'm going to ask you all to get up and stand up. <clears throat> and then you all turn to the right. Just turn to the right and get your arms up and just start massaging the person who's in front of you. <laughs> just, just a 30 second rub on their shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and then, ah, okay, so turn around, and now it's the, no, 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 the people who missed it, so turn around and do it on the other side. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So at Eden Speakerman, um, we work with the center of what we do is brand. That's like a lot of other agencies who have uh, been here today. And the case I'm going to talk about is actually a Dutch, Dutch case. It was, uh, got quite some attention and got shown on the TEDx last year, where uh, my friend and partner Joost from Holland introduced the case. The case... Um, is about actually um, making the impossible happen. And by doing that, we used our four competence areas that we have at Inch Beekerman, and uh, we worked together collaboratively to um, develop this case. Um, it's a case with all odds against it, and I have chosen to uh, tell you the story today from the angle of here, is all the th here are all the things we did wrong, and here is all the things that we here in this audience, no matter if we're on the agency side, or if we're, if we're on the organizational side, or maybe a student, can learn from this case, hopefully. And that's also what our workshop at four o'clock is about, is how can you actually start to overcome all the um, trouble by bridging what service design does is that it bridges a lot of different departments, a lot of different internal cultures and organizations, and how do we, as the ones driving the projects, actually manage all these gaps, to close all these gaps, and to co overcome all these cultural barriers. We went into it maybe a little bit blindly, and um, here is what I hope I can share with you what we learned about it. So here's the team. The team consists of our uh, colleagues um, from Amsterdam and also some colleagues from a design research company called Standby. And together we worked on this um, concept. And really, um, who was our client? Our client was called ProRail. They are in Utrecht and in Amsterdam. They are responsible for all the infrastructure around the railways and their communication departments came to us and said, we have a challenge for you. Um, we need to improve safety and comfort on the platform. That we have a lot of uh, construction work going on. It's really unsafe. It's a very uh, cluttered situation. And we need you, basically, it sounded like a straightforward job. We need you to produce some posters. So, um, as is in service design, we looked into what is the real problem to solve, uh, what is actually here? What are we dealing with? Can't just be communication. We can't just put up some posters and think that the problem is solved. So let's solve. So let's dig into the problem. 
Um, we found that there was a lot of people using public transport. It's good that people start using public transport instead of cars, but it meant that the uh, um, whole area around the stations were very cluttered. Um, there were some safety issues. They were actually afraid that people were going to fall off the platforms and it was uh, sort of dangerous. And also people were confused because Due to construction work, uh, the situation changed all the time. Trains were somewhat different, platforms were used differently. So the first thing we produced was that we resisted the demand of actually producing a big report about our research, but we came up with visualizations where we basically visualized where is it that people have their problems, where do they meet the challenges, and also what turned out to be a very, very good, and this is also Mauno said it, and a lot of other people said it already today, by producing uh, videos and documenting the um, uncomfortable reality, we made people understand that there was really a broader problem, a much uh, worse problem to solve than uh, just producing some posters. And this is where the first breakdown actually happened because through the thorough research, we didn't have a client anymore. So there was a well-known problem. There were, you know, there was a real need, challenges, but the communication department said, yeah, we can't take this off our budget because we are not responsible for what the real problem is, which was how do people move around on the platform? So we had to look for different internal stakeholders, and we found someone who said, okay, we are going to spend some money uh, on actually identifying some solutions, because this is uh, very hard to have some problems, and nobody are going to buy into problems. It's not very glamorous, glamorous in an organization to take over a huge problem. People need to take over solutions and have success experiences in actually solving these solutions internally in the organization. So we came up with a lot of solutions, one of them being also for us a very attractive um, solution saying we need some dynamic indications. We're in the world of real-time data and uh, mobility and near-field technology. We must come up with some dynamic indications that re react, uh, react flexibly on all the uh, changes on the stations. Everybody loved it, but here came the second breakdown. There was no business case. So there were nobody who actually had in their budget a goal, a business goal that matched exactly this solution. So we were left again with the problem with all these passengers who were unhappy and nothing happened. Now we're talking about a time span here for one and a half years. So we're really talking about, you know, an extensive project and a lot of people just didn't want to deal with this project anymore. They didn't want to hear about it. Um, so we needed to go one step back and we needed to sit down and redefine the project. And in redefining the project, we try to look at what are actually the business goals in this organization called ProRail, and how can we define the challenge. The challenge hasn't changed. It's only a matter of how we talk about it, so that we actually um, can have a buy-in and can have a business case. And we did, did it by making it much more tangible and saying, we want to improve the transfer process on the platform. It has to be faster and more comfortable. Now, this is a solution that we thought it would be easier to get a buy-in on in the organization. So what we did was we started some new research. We did um, spend a lot of time on the platforms. We had people fill out diaries to talk about their experience. Again, like Maunus talk, talked about, there's a huge difference between daily commuters who just don't want to deal with the fact that they're on this stupid platform again for the 10th time this week, and they just want to get home in peace and quiet, and people who come for the first time, who've nev who's never been to the um, railway station before, never been to the city, and are uh, confused in a completely different way. We also did a lot of ghost shadowing, we followed people around, looked at how they acted, and what we found was that there was a lot of running around. That was, if there was one basic finding here, that was that people 
paced on the platforms because they didn't really know where the trains were going to stop and what was going to happen today. So people moved around unnecessarily. That again caused a lot of insecurity and uh, a lot of more sort of traffic on the platform. So after we had realized the extent of these problems, we started a co-creation workshop with, the pa with some passengers, and we lo looked at to see what they came up with, what ideas did they, they actually come up with themselves. And they came up with a lot of great ideas, which we based on our own ideation. So our own ideation was a lot about looking into what can modern technology do, and uh, how can you use the different uh, NFC, et cetera, to create a much faster uh, transfer process. And here are some of the concepts that we came up with. Some, one are pretty straight, some are pretty straightforward, like uh, smaller platform sectors. We also came up with, wouldn't it be great to have an app where you could just see where are, which um, train uh, carriages are full and which are still have space in them? Um, or what if the platform itself communicates with you? You know, what if you have some interactive spaces that can talk to you and, and show, um, indicate um, the changes? Warnings, incoming trains, they have this already in Copenhagen at the uh, airport. That's nothing new. It's just like a stripe that lights up, lights up where the train comes in to say, this is where it stops. But it doesn't give any indications of where are all the people in the back, in the front, you know, where can I still sit down if I'm commuting for the next 40 minutes and want to sleep or read my newspaper. And we also came up with, what if we indicate zones or the six um, would be, if I, if I have this uh, th um, thing, that this would be for people who don't um, have any smartphones. If I have this uh, little device, I can put and hold my ticket against it. It will scan the barcode and it will tell me, give me a little slip with the information that I need. Basically, you could do it in an app, but a lot of people would not have a smartphone and that would be another way of, of doing it. And again, wayfinding, most mobile station navigation on my, on my smartphone. So um, we evaluated all these different solutions with stakeholders, and we actually made them shop. So these are stakeholders from most of ProRail, and we said to them, you know, have a look at all these and see how they can match. Are there any solutions in there that can actually ma match the business goals of your department? So um, what we found in this interaction was that we added a lot of value to the ideas we had had through the knowledge from, you know, how does this organization work and how do we have to redefine some of these concepts to actually um, match the business goals that were already set in the organization. And this was a very, turned out to be a very important move where we actually managed to package some very nice uh, potential solutions that were also uh, underlined with a solid business case. So we had this nice selection of ideas and we were really ready to start and look at who can actually implement some of these ideas. And then came the third breakdown. Because during and after this workshop, we really realized that ProRail as an organization didn't have the data necessary. Now, this was also what Maunus talked about. You know, what we needed was data about the incoming trains, about the departing times, um, and about, you know, where does it stop? A lot of real-time data that were not accessible in ProRail. So ProRail by now uh, realized we have to collaborate with Dutch Railways and we have to find partners. So what did we do? We started a roadshow. The roadshow was actually, we called it Fishing for Partners because it was basically a sales pitch. Now by then, this project has been go had been going on about a year and there were a lot of people at Dutch Railways who were not really enthusiastic about this case. So uh, there were some workshops that were okay and there were some workshops that did not have that much energy in them because people at Dutch Rail said, you know, this looks like this is complex. I don't know if I can win anything. You know, I only have a limited budget. 
uh, I, I don't even know if we can implement this solution and what if we spend my budget and there's no solution coming out of it, how do I stand, what does that look, make me look like in the organization? And of course they were right. I mean, that's what a lot of innovation processes are about. It's about taking risks and believing in a concept and actually just start to work on it and implement it. Also, Maunus talked about, you know, having the concept development and in the implementation phase going at the same time. And I think if it's doable, that is one very important solution. So still within one of these um, workshop, we managed to catch a big fish, and the big fish was that uh, one of the people from Dutch Railways said, we have this data, because we actually installed cameras in the carriages, so we can give you the data. We use them for something completely different, but maybe we can use them for this. So through all this shopping around and through this roadshow, we managed to find the incredible match of a solution and two departments, two organizations who would never have communicated finding a solution. But then came the fourth breakdown. And the fourth breakdown was it, that by now the solution had become so big that we were running out of time and uh, we only had three months to realize it. Nobody believed in it and we didn't have the um, budgets again. There was a different kind of budget than people were ready, ready to pay. So we came up with another idea, which is also something that has been talked about today. We started to visualize the solution. So we made just very simple drawings, visualizations of what could the solution actually look like. And this was a breakthrough because it made people understand what this was all about. So if you can imagine it, if you can talk about it, if you can show it, it's of course much easier to get the budget for it and to move on in the project. So that's what happened. These were the uh, visualizations. And um, they showed where when the train come in, this uh, LED um, lights up and it just shows you know where do you stand to be able so that you're sure to get a seat when you access the train. Uh, the final result is very, very close to this. The final result um, was installed um, at the airport, at the airport, sorry, at the railway station, and uh, it's the world first real-time boarding information system, and it was uh, tried out as a prototype for three months, and now Dutch Rail are looking at developing it in a way that it can actually uh, be implemented on all railway stations in Holland. So um, it could be seen on the Bosch station, but uh, shortly we hope it will be in all of Holland. Um, so what I want to share with you just very shortly are four things that we have learned um, throughout this process. One is if you're working with organizations who are not used to accommodating implementation, uh, uh, innovation, you need to prepare them for fuzzy processes. So starting a process with a budget and a goal is a completely uh, different story than starting with a challenge or a problem. And if people are not prepared for this, and if the organization in us is not prepared for this, you will experience that no matter how great the concepts are, they, you are going to die in the process, basically. Um, also, being designers, we love to think in creative solutions and we love to make things happen. But you also need to um, think about the business cases. So you need to bridge the gap between design and business. It's nothing new, it's been said a lot of times today, but this was the only way we actually had to move forward that made us move forward in this process. The third lesson, Newcomers mess it all up. They have not been part of the process. They ask all the questions that have been asked 50 times. And the way we found was the best way to actually deal with that was to show the videos. So we shown the vid showed the videos again and again of the unhappy people, of the unhappy passengers complaining, complaining. Um, but they need to be very short briefings. People don't have a lot of time. Don't make any reports, no long uh, lectures. Just show the results, show the videos, make it simple, make it accessible. And the last lesson is also uh, said about Reiseplan. It is visions are magic. You know, 
make it happen, make it visualize it, no matter how coarse it is, and no matter how early it is in the stage, build a prototype, do something to make it come true. Thank you, these are our experiences. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, that was great. So, questions? Anyone? Oh. No questions? No? no questions? Really? OK. Well, the good news is, you know, if you want to continue the conversation, you guys are doing this workshop at 4 o'clock. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to say something quickly about it, but. Uh, yes, we're actually digging into these four challenges some more in our 4 o'clock workshop for people who want to join us. How did we actually do it, and how can the experiences that you have already made, how can we share this and come up with some good new solutions to move service design ahead. And I have so one more question, sorry. In the meantime, I got the microphone up here, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm just in the middle up here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> waving, okay. <laughs> um, so the question was that you were, um, you said you were assigned to a very specific and rather small problem with designing posters, actually. And then in the end, you spent like almost a year on this. So how was this process going then budget-wise or ownership-wise? Were you just able to prolong the process over and over again by convincing the client that this takes more time or is bigger than um, thought about before? Or did you just do it pro bono in the hope that in the end you can sell the whole process to them? So <laughs> we, did it. Oh. we made s small steps. Um, after the first uh, research, we had more collateral uh, insights than the pointed ones, and we we, had a, we found some people who thought it's it's a waste to don't uh, uh, get deeper into this. So we find some people to make first step, and then it keeps rolling and rolling. I think the what's different on this kind of project, it started small, we didn't have a backup from the management, and it makes it quite difficult to involve people. We have to persuade every stakeholder. So a lot so of persuasion, a lot of talking, a lot of presenting again and again and again. Right, good, okay. So unfortunately, we're okay. out of time, yes. so, thank but you. thank you so much, and... Yeah. Um... Uh.